Hi everyone and welcome to another video of linear motion or motion in a straight line. So today's video is going to be dealing with velocity time graphs and this is also an important and key part of linear motion or motion in a straight line. So get your notebook and then let's learn something new. All right, let's get into today's video. All right, so we look at velocity time graphs. So this can take on three forms. So you can actually have a graph that represents uniform acceleration. So in take out uniform acceleration, the graph is actually drawn this way, where the y-axis represents the velocity and then where the x-axis represents the time taken. So this is how we represent uniform acceleration. And then there is that where you represent uniform velocity. So that means that velocity is constant. So as you can see, we actually have it in a straight line. So it means that velocity is constant. Then there is another form which is uniform deceleration. So it basically means that the acceleration reduces in a uniform way. So this is actually how we represent uniform deceleration. So all these three forms shall be useful in this section of velocity time graphs. So they can be combined into one journey. So let's look at the combined stages of motion. So this is an example of what we actually represent usually. So here we actually have uniform acceleration, we have uniform velocity, and we have uniform deceleration. So we have, for example, like a car moving from point A, then it moves to point B, to point C, and then lastly to point D. So it's moving from A to B, it moves with uniform acceleration. As it's moving from B to C, it moves with a uniform velocity. And then when it moves from C to D, it moves with a uniform deceleration so the s here s1 represents the distance from a to b s2 represents the distance from b to c and then s3 represents the distance from c to d and they and then as you can see t1 is the time taken to move from a to b t2 is the time taken to move from b to c and then t3 is the time taken to move from c to d and obviously this t here is going to representing is representing the total time taken from point a up to point d Alright, so now looking at these combined stages of motion, we can see that the total area under the velocity time graph represents the total distance traveled. What does that mean? It means if you look under this velocity time graph, you can actually see three different shapes. So you can actually see here is actually a right angle triangle. Then this middle one is actually a rectangle. And then this one here is actually another right angled triangle. So if you actually measure the area of actually these three different parts, you can actually get the distance moved the distance s1 plus s2 plus s3 the distance from a to d so as you can see if we want to find the distance from a to b which is s1 it can be a half times as you can see we have uh t1 half times t1 which is the time taken to move from a to b times v so we actually just measure the velocity at this point right here so that v value is actually going to be the one that we shall use so if we also want to find the area under the graph from this part this is the same as t2 times v the v value that you have so that's how we find the distance s2 then to find the distance s3 which is the distance from here to here we can use a half times t3 which is the distance from here to here times v which is actually the velocity at that point the maximum velocity so now if we see that, that the total distance from A to D is S is equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3. All right, so alternatively, this shape A, B, C, D is also a trapezium. So we can actually decide to consider the shape as one and generally get the general area and consider it as a trapezium. And how will we do that? We can actually alternatively say that S is equal to a half times V times, so all we shall need is uh, this value t2 which represents the time from b to c and then we'll just need the time from a to d which is this t right here so if we say s is equal to a half times v maximum velocity times t plus t2 we can also get the same distance from a to d so you can either choose this method or you can choose this method all right so we're going to look at a question from minute 2003 and this was question number eight so I've been told that a train starts from station A with uniform acceleration of 0 0.2 meters per second squared for 2 minutes. And the train, and it attains a maximum speed. So it's moving until it attains a maximum speed and moves uniformly for 15 minutes. 
It is then brought to rest at a constant retardation of 5 over 3 meters per second squared at station B. Find the distance between stations A and B. Alright, so next we're going to sketch this our velocity time graph and then on that we're actually going to have the axis for velocity and that for time. Now we can see that we start from point A and now we're going to represent uniform acceleration and we've said before that this is how we represent uniform acceleration. So it's, we've said it moves with uniform acceleration for 2 minutes until it attains a maximum speed. So V is going to be labeling the maximum speed it actually attains. Then we've said it moves for 2 minutes which is actually basically equal to 120 seconds. So this is what we label there. So now this is the first step. Then we say, and then it moves uniformly for 15 minutes. So that means that at that point now, after reaching here, the speed will become uniform. So it's uniform velocity, which is actually a straight line. And then we can actually see that the distance from A to this point can actually be the same, represented as S1. And then next we're being told that it moves uniformly for 15 minutes. And remember that uniform velocity is represented as a horizontal line as you can see right there and we said it moves like that for 15 minutes and if you convert 15 minutes in two seconds which is 15 times 60 you'll get 900 and then we're going to represent the distance from this point to this point as s2 so this is what we have right now so next we're being told that it is then brought to rest at a constant retardation of 5 over 3 meters per second squared at station b and remember how we represent a retardation it's actually a line going downwards like that. So this is basically how we represent uniform retardation until it reaches station B. And then we're going to represent the time taken to move from this point to this point B as T3. Now we are not given that time, so we're just going to label it as T3. So this is time 1, this is time 2, and this is time 3. And then this distance from this point to point B is going to be represented as S3. So basically we've now represented our velocity time graph and this is how we make it look so now we're being asked it is then brought to rest at a constant retardation of 5 over 3 meters per second squared at station b then we're being told to find the distance between stations a and stations b so we actually have to find the distance from here to here so now how are we going to do that so one of the most important things we need to identify is the value of v which is actually the maximum velocity that was attained by the train so we need to find that and as you can see we can actually find it from looking at this region so actually going to consider this region so let me let me assume that this region here is uh, probably c and then this is probably d so this is just like an assumption for my calculation so we're going to be looking at the motion from a to c and we're going to use that to find the value of v now as you can see at the very beginning here, the value of velocity is zero because it started from here. So remember that u shall actually be equal to zero, as you can see right there. And then to move from A to C, the acceleration was given and we're told that it moved at a uniform acceleration of 0 0.2. So that is also known. So we have that as 0 0.2. And then next, we know that the time it took to move from A to C is 120 seconds. So the time is actually known as 120 seconds so as you can already see what we are looking for is v so we want to find the value of v when it reached point c so how are we going to do that we can actually clearly see that the first equation of motion is clearly a good fit so maximum velocity moving away from a shall actually be equal to v is equal to u plus a t so i always encourage anyone who wants to do this to actually first consider what is given and what is available that will actually make it easier for us to find a certain value that we're looking for. So in this case, the best suit is the first equation of motion. So we can actually see that wherever there is A, we'll put 0 0.2, and wherever there is T, we'll put 1, 20, and U is 0. So we'll get V as 24 meters per second. All right, so next, one of the other things that is going to be very key is for us to actually know what this value of T3 is, but actually I cannot tell right now. But because I now know that the velocity v is actually 24 now, it means I can consider this stage of the motion. So let's keep it this way. So this is still c and this is d. So now we're considering the motion from this point to this point from here. So as you can see, at d, at the point d, if we consider the motion from here to here alone, at point d, u shall uh, was actually 24. So that's actually what we are looking at. And then at the end, when the train reached point b, it 
rested. So there, V became zero, as you can see. And then we're given the uniform retardation from here to here, of which A shall actually be equal to, because this is a retardation, we'll have it as a negative, which is negative 5 over 3. And we do not know what that time is, so we're be, going to be looking at 43, but we know all the other values. So in this case, we can also use the first equation of motion to find T3. So V shall actually be equal to U plus 80, so we're going to substitute the values. So we're going to have 24 minus remember the a is a negative so that's why we have a negative a minus right here minus 5 over 3 and the time is t 3 so now we're going to make t the subject so as you can see we'll have t being t3 being equal to 14.4 seconds and you'll do that if you cross multiply multiply 3 to 24 you get a value that when you divide by 5 you get 14.4 seconds so now that we know what t3 is we can now actually find the distance from a to B using either of the two formulas that we actually knew before. So I'm going to use the easiest one. I'm going to use the formula of distance between two sessions that uses the area of a trapezium. So we're going to have S being equal to a half times V, of which V we know, and then we're going to have times T, T which is the distance from A to B, I mean the time taken to move from A to B, which is going to be 120 plus 900 plus 14.4. So substituting in those values, we'll have a half times 24. And then where we have T, when you added all the times, we'll have 1034.4 plus T2, which is 900. And then S shall actually be equal to 23,212.8 meters. And that is the answer. All right, so question number two. We're being told that a car from rest accelerates steadily for 10 seconds up to a velocity of 20 meters per second. It continues with a uniform velocity for a further 30 seconds and then decelerates so that it stops in 20 seconds. So being told to draw a velocity time graph to represent this motion. And then B, to calculate the acceleration, deceleration, distance traveled and average speed. So let's first represent this on a velocity time graph. So now we have our axis, we have velocity and we have time, right? There. Then the cow, as you said, we're going to assume it starts from a point A that we have right there. So being told it acts, it comes from rest. So that means it starts from point zero right here and moves steadily for 10 seconds up to a velocity of 20 meters per second. So as you can see, it's going to accelerate steadily. So this is where we have the acceleration. So we've represented it right here. And we're saying that happens up to a velocity of 20 meters per second in 10 seconds. So as you can see, this is where we attain the velocity of 20 meters per second. And then the time taken is 10 seconds, as you can see right there. And then this distance is going to be represented by S1. All right, so next we're going to represent the portion of it that represents the uniform velocity. And then this is what we have. So uniform velocity is basically a horizontal line. It continues with the uniform velocity for a further 30 second so that means that the time t2 is 30 seconds as you can see right there and then the distance is going to be represented as s2 and then lastly we're being told it then decelerates that it stops in 20 seconds so that means we know the time taken to move from this point to this point as 20 and then we're going to be presenting that distance as s3 so first of all we're being told to find the acceleration a how are we going to do that so we're going to consider any portion that we actually want, but I've chosen to consider the portion moving from here to here. So I'm going to imagine that this is probably point C and this is point D. And then we can already see that it comes from rest. So that means U is actually zero. And then as you can already see, when it reaches this point, it attains a maximum velocity of 20. So V is 20. And as you can see, it also moves from A to C in a time of 10 seconds. So we're going to have our time, T1 is 10 seconds. So that actually means that since we know the U, we know the V, we know the T1, and we all know want to find the acceleration, you can actually use the first equation of motion. So from V is equal to U plus A T, we're going to have 20 being equal to 0 plus 10 A. So this is what we have. And then if we make A the subject, A shall actually be equal to 20 over 10, of which A shall actually be equal to 2 meters per second squared. So now we know the acceleration. So part 2, we're being told to find the deceleration. So we need to know the deceleration from here to here. 
and how are we going to do that? So let's consider the motion from D to B because this is where the deceleration happens in this portion. So as you can see at this point, the value of u, the starting velocity is u being equal to 20. So u is 20 at the beginning and then we can see that at the end when the car comes to a stop, v becomes 0. And then we don't know what A is because that deceleration is what we're going to be looking for. But now that happens in a time which is T3 and T3 is equal to 20 seconds at that point. So you can also use the first equation of motion for this part. So we'll have V is equal to U plus AT, which will have 0 being equal to 20 plus 20A, of which we shall have negative 20 being equal to 20A of which a shall actually be equal to negative 1 meters per second squared. So the answer is a negative because it's actually representing a deceleration. All right, so next we're being asked to find the distance traveled. So that means the distance from point A to point B. And how are we going to do that? So it's actually going to be easy in this case. So as you can see, we already have these three shapes right here. We have this uh, right angle triangle. We have this square rectangle here then we have this right angle triangle right here so basically we're going to be finding the area of this the area of this and then the area of that to actually find the distances s1 s2 and s3 so as you can see for this right angle triangle we actually have this portion of it is going to be represented as 20 and then this portion of it which is the best is going to be represented as 10 so that means in this case we have a half times 10 which is the best times 20 which is the height so that will give us the value of s1 and then if we go to this second region right here we'll have a, this is actually a rectangle so which it's better it's just like length times we did to find the area so it's basically 30 times this height which is 20 then if you look at this last region here to find s3 we'll have 20 times this height which is 20 which is a half times 20 times 20 so basically, to find the distance traveled S, S shall actually be equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3, of which S1 is a half times 10 times 20 plus, S2 is 30 times 20 plus, S3 which is a half times 20 times 20. And obviously, this gives us 100, this gives us 600, and this gives us 200. So now we'll have S being equal to 900 meters. And then lastly, we're being told to find the average speed, of which... Average speed is equal to total distance over total time. So we know the total distance as 900. And then if we total all the times, which we'll have, we'll have 10 plus 30 plus 20, which is actually equal to 60 seconds. So we have 90 over, I mean 900 over 60, which is 15 meters per second. And that is the average speed. All right, so moving on to question number three, we're being told that two stations A and B are a distance of 6x meters apart along a straight track. They'll be told that a train starts from rest at A and accelerates uniformly to a speed of V meters per second, covering a distance x meters. So the train maintains this speed until it has traveled a further 3x meters. It then returns uniformly to rest at B. Sketch a velocity time graph for the motion and show that if t is the time taken for the train to travel from A to B, then t is equal to 9x over v second. So we're going to first sketch this. So here is our velocity time graph. And then we're going to start from station A right here. So now starting from station A, we're being told that the stations are a distance of 6x meters apart. So we shall consider that later. But now we're saying a train starts from rest. So it's aside from rest. That means the initial velocity is zero right here and accelerates uniformly so this is how we represent uniform acceleration to a speed of v meters per second so this is the speed v and then we're going to assume that the time taken to move from this point to this point is t1 and then as we've been told it moves accelerates uniformly to a speed of v covering a distance x meters so that means our s1 value is x so it is given as x and then we're being told that the train maintains this speed until it has traveled a further 3x meters. So that means that at this moment, the speed is actually maintained. So that means that V remains uniform. So that's why we have it like that. So it is done like that until it has traveled a further 3x 
meters. So what does that mean? It means that this distance from here to here is 3x meters. And then we're going to assume that the time taken to move from this point right here until this point is, th is t2. And then we're being told that later it then retards uniformly to rest at b. So now we're going to represent the retardation. So in this case, we do not know what the distance from here, here to here is. But we know the time taken is t3. Now, but this is actually going to be easier to find out. Because we've been told that the two stations A and B are distance 6x meters apart. So that means that if this is x and then this is 3x, it basically means that this to find this other distance will have 6x minus the total of this and this. So 3x plus x is 4x. So 6x minus 4x is 2x. So we can now know the distance from this point to this point as 2x. So that's what we have right there. Now, basically, I'm going to consider the equation that we used to actually find the, the distance using the knowledge of a trapezium. So now, we've been told that the time taken to move from A to B is actually T, which is that. So this is actually what we have to prove. Now, I'm going to be using this knowledge. So remember that another way of finding S, which is the total distance, is a half times V times T which is the total this time taken to move from A to B. Now we've been told that that is being represented by capital T. And then we always have to add that to T2. Okay. So now for this case, we actually now know, so there are some elements that are known. The distance from A to B is actually 6x. So that's going to be very, very key. So now that is 6x. And then we know that V which is the maximum velocity is v, so that is already given. And then what we do not know is t2. So what we are going to do is we're going to have to first find t2. So now to find t2, we're going to be considering the motion from this point to this point. So basically we're considering the motion c, d. So at point c, we can actually see that the time from to move from here to here is actually going to be the t2 that we're going to be looking for. So we're basically considering this. And then the distance from c to d is being represented as c3, x so s at that point is 3x actually i can call that s2 because that is the second part the second stage of the motion and then as you can see because there is uniform speed or constant speed it means that a is actually equal to zero now also at this moment i can actually see that the since the speed is constant it actually basically means that u is equal to v so that is because it's constant. So now when I look at that, it basically means that if I consider this this movement from here to here, I actually have to use another equation of motion. So I'm not going to use the first equation of motion. I'll have to use the second equation of motion. So to find time t2, I'm going to use the second equation of motion, which is s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, of which my s value is now going to be equal to 3x for this region. And then... As I've said, u is equal to v. So wherever there is u, I'm going to put v. v t2, because the time is t2, plus a half times, into bracket, because acceleration is zero, I'm going to have a zero times t2 squared. Now this zero times, all these will make them cancel, and I'll be left with 3x being equal to v t2. And then if I make t2 the subject, t2 should actually be equal to 3x over v. So now that I know t2, I'm going to substitute it into this equation that I used to find the total distance. Uh, using the knowledge of a uh, area of a trapezium and then we're going to m find and make t the subject c if this proof will come out so the formula for total distance is s is equal to a half times v times t plus t2 of which as we've said before t represents the total distance i mean the total time taken from beginning to the end which is going to now be capital t plus t2 which we discovered as 3x over v times this v times a half and then the total distance is 6x so when you multiply all those i can set when i cross multiply this i'll have 12x being equal to v into bracket t plus 3x over v and then next i can say i can divide v on both sides divide this v on both sides and i have 12x over b being equal to t plus 3x over v now i can also see i can actually find the lcm right here so the lcm shall be v so I have V 
divide by 1 shall actually be equal to v, v times t, which is tv plus 3x over v. Now I can also see that this and this v and this v will cancel. And then I'll be left with 12x being equal to tv plus 3x, of which if I try to make tv the subject, tv shall actually be equal to 12x minus 3x. 12x minus 3x shall actually be equal to 9x. Now tv shall actually be equal to 9x, of which if I make t the subject, t shall actually be equal to 9x over v seconds. And thus we've proved what they asked for. All right, so question number four. We're being told that a car traveling at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour I mean, a car is traveling at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour for 20 seconds, and then it is brought to rest in 8 seconds. Then we're being told, then we're being told draw a velocity time graph and find the distance traveled. Now, the unique thing about this question is the speed is given in 90 kilometers per hour, so we're going to have to change that because the time here is in 20 seconds. So I'm going to change this to meters per second. And then next, we can actually see that the car is traveling at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. So we've not been told that the car is starting from rest. So the car was starting at that speed. So this is going to be a different kind of velocity time graph compared to the ones that we've done before. So now, first of all, let's convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second. So we'll have this as 90 times 1000 over 3600, which should actually be equal to 25 meters per second. So, all right, so next, let's represent this on a velocity time graph. So as we said before, now we're not starting from rest. So we're going to start from a velocity of 25 meters per second. So now here is velocity and time. And then we're going to start from a point P, which is now somewhere where there's 25 meters per second. So we're going to begin from a point right about here, which is actually 25 meters per second. So I've been told that the car is traveling for 25 meters per second for 20 seconds. So we're going to moving at that, at that from here to here for 20 seconds and then the distance i mean the speed is 25 meters per second and that happens for 20 seconds and then it is brought to rest in eight seconds so we're going to represent the distance moving from this point to this point as s1 and then next we are now representing the deceleration because the car was brought to rest in a period of eight seconds so now we're going to imagine that the point of rest is point q and then this distance here to move from here to it moved in eight seconds so that distance there is represented as S2, as you can see. So this is now our velocity time graph. So next, we're being told to find the distance traveled. So that distance traveled is basically S1 plus S2. So let's do that. So distance traveled is S1 plus S2. So now, basically, this part here, we're going to be considering the area of a rectangle. So this is 20 times 25. So that's why we have it like that. And then this is a right angle triangle. So we're going to be considering a half times this 8, which is the base, times 25, which I represent the height. So when you multiply those, we'll have 500 plus 100, of which S shall actually be equal to 600 meters. And therefore, this was the distance traveled by the car. So the car travels a distance of 600 meters. Question number five, we're being told that a car travels between two trading centers P and Q. It starts from rest and accelerates at 2.5 meters per second squared until it reaches a speed of 40 meters per second and then maintains this speed for a distance of 3,120 meters. It then decelerated at 4 meters per second squared to rest at Q. So sketch the velocity time graph and then determine the time taken for the car to move from P to Q and then find the average speed of the car. So this is also an easy one. Let's first draw the velocity time graph. So now we're being told that it starts from center P. So it starts and accelerates at 2.5 meters per second until it reaches 40 meters per second. Now we've, been, we've not been told how much time it will take to move from this point to the point where it gets that maximum speed. So basically we're just representing it that way. So the maximum speed is 40. And then the time we're going to just say it's T. One. So we're going to be representing that distance from this to this as S1. Now next, we're being told that it maintains the speed for a distance of 3,120 meters. So now, showing that the speed is uniform, we're going to have a flat line just like that. So now, this time taken to move from here to here is going to be equal to T2. And then we're going to represent in that distance as 3,120 meters and then we're being told that it then decelerated at four meters per second to rest at 
Q. Sat is point Q. And then we don't know the time, but we want to say it's T3. And then the distance, we're going to be presenting it as S3. So that's what we have basically in the velocity time graph. All right, so first thing first, because we're being told to find the time taken for the car to move from point P to point Q, we're going to have to first find the values of the different times. So that's going to be the first key thing. So let's first find T1. So we're going to be looking at the distance from here to here. So let's look at that point alone. So we can see that at the beginning here, the value of u is 0. Then we can also see that at the highest point, the maximum velocity v attained is what? 40. So we know that v. Then we'll be told that it accelerated from this point to this point for 2.5 meters per second. So we have a as 2.5. So we know what u is, we know what v is, and we know what a is. And then what we're looking for is t1. So to find t1, we're going to use the first equation of motion, which is v is equal to u plus a t. Now we can say at 40 is equal to 0 plus 2.5 t1. And then if I make t1 the subject, t1 should actually be equal to 16 seconds. And this is the time taken to move from this point to this point. All right, so next we're now going to be looking for how to find t2. So let's consider this motion from this point here to this point right there. So as you can see, at the very beginning here, first of all, we know the distance from that point to that point is 3,120. So you know the distance. Now we can also see we're looking for t2, so which it is the unknown. So this is what we don't know. And then we can see that since here we're maintaining uniform speed, that means that acceleration should actually be equal to zero. And then basically u should actually be equal to v at that point because the initial velocity here is the same as the final velocity. So we're going to basically use the second equation of motion for this. So to find time t2, we're going to use the second equation of motion, which is s is equal to ut plus a half at squared. So we have 3,120 being equal to vt2 plus a half into bracket 0 times t2 squared. So now we can actually say this all cancels and we'll be left with 3,120 being equal to that. But we know that v is 40. So we have 40 t2. Now if we make t2 the subject, t2 should actually be equal to 3,120 divided by 40, which is 78 seconds. So lastly, to find t3, we can consider the motion from this point to this point Q. So now let's look at that. Now you can see that the initial velocity here, sh we should actually begin from 40 meters per second. So u is 40 at the beginning. Then we can see we're looking for t3, which is the unknown. And then the final velocity at this moment, when it comes to rest at the end, it should actually be 0. So v is zero and then we're being told that it decelerated at four meters per second squared so that means that a is because it's a deceleration it shall be negative four meters per second squared so because i know v i know what u is and i know what a is so to find t3 we shall use the first equation of motion to find time t3 from first equation of motion v is equal to u plus a t we can have zero being equal to 40 plus into bracket negative 43 so this is what we have right now. So if I do this, I can actually take this 43 to the other side, and then I can divide both sides by 4, of which I'll get T3 being equal to 10 seconds. So now to find that total time taken to move from the beginning to the end, I'll have T being equal to T1 plus T2 plus T3, of which I have 16 plus 78 plus 10, of which the answer is 104 seconds. So therefore, the car takes 104 seconds to move from P to Q. All right, so lastly, we're being told to find the average speed of the car. Average speed should actually be equal to total distance over total time. So now, to find the total distance, I'm going to use the equation of finding the area of a trapezium, which is a half times V times T, which is the time taken from beginning to end plus T2. But good enough, I already know both of these values and I also know what the v is. So now I'll have it as a half times 40 times into bracket 104 which is the total time taken plus t2. And then the answer should actually be equal to 3640 meters. Now that I know that total distance I can now find the average speed which should actually be equal to 3640 divided by 104 
So therefore, the average speed of the car is 35 meters per second. So moving on to the next question. So we're being told that a car travels along a horizontal road passing two points A and B. So pay attention. The car passes at passes A at two meters per second and maintains the speed for 60 meters, I mean for 60 seconds, during which it travels 900 meters. Approaching a junction, the car then slows down at a uniform rate of A meters per second squared over the next 125 meters to reach a speed of 10 meters per second at which instant with the road clear the car accelerates uniformly at 0 0.75 meters per second squared this acceleration is maintained for 20 seconds by which time the car has reached a speed of v meters per second which is then maintained the car passes b 45 seconds after its speed reaches v meters per second then we're being told to find the values of u, a, and v. And then, part two, sketch a velocity time graph for the motion of the car between a and b. Then part three, find the distance between points a and b and the time taken by the car to travel this distance. So how are we going to solve this? All right, so let's work this out. So in the first part, we're being asked to find the values of u, a, and v. So we're being told that the car travels along a horizontal straight road passing points a and b. So being told that at the beginning, at the first stage of motion, that the car passes A at U. So that means that we have U at the, at the initial speed at the very beginning. And then it maintains the speed for 60 seconds. So we know T is 60. So that's very important. During which it travels 900 meters. So we know that S is 900 there is a keyword being used there and we're being told it maintains this speed so that means that there is uniform speed there so that actually means that uh, u is actually equal to v and then it means that a is actually equal to zero so those are the key points right there so i can already see that to find the value of u I actually use have to use the second equation of motion so to find the initial velocity in first stage u is i'm going to find it from second equation of motion which is s is equal to ut plus a half at squared so i have 900 being equal to u then that t time t1 for that first stage of motion plus a half times zero times t1 squared so i'll have 900 being equal to 60 u plus a half uh, times zero times 60 squared of which this zero multiplies this and i have a zero times this is zero so i'll be left with 900 being equal to 60 of which you should actually be equal to 15 meters per second so now i've been able to solve and find the value of u all right so next let's look at the second state of the motion so i've been told approaching a junction the car then slows down at a uniform rate of a so now we know what we know that we have a involved right there over the next 125 meters so s is 125 so we're being told and then next 125 meters to reach a speed of 10 meters per second so that actually means that v is what v is 10 meters per second and that case at which instant okay so that's actually the second stage of the motion so now we've been told the beginning that that the car slows down so that actually means that the a is a deceleration so that's very very important and so it's, it decelerates at a uniform rate so that's very very important so we know what v is we know what s is we know what a is but we don't know what time is so what are we going to use in this case we're going to be using the third equation of motion which is this so finding acceleration in that second stage a we shall have from that equation of motion, v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as, of which we'll have 10 squared being equal to 15 squared plus 2 times 125a, of which we shall have 100 being equal to 25 plus 250a, of which we'll have negative 125 being equal to 250a, then a shall actually be equal to negative 0 0.5 meters per second squared. So now we know the acceleration. Let's look at that third stage of the motion. So this was what we had. Then last we were being told with the road clear, the car accelerates. So it may not be the last part, but this is going to help give us, I believe, the value of V. 
So being told with the road clear, the car accelerates uniformly at 0 0.75 meters per second. So that means that in that next stage, A is, A is 0 0.75. So we know the value of A. Then say this acceleration is maintained for 20 seconds. So that means T is 20 for that next stage. By which time the car has reached a speed of V meters per second which is then maintained. And then last we have to ask ourselves from that previous stage of motion, what was the speed before? Because we had not rested. So remember that at that former stage of motion, the speed was V is equal to 10 meters per second. So that actually means that when we begin this third stage of motion, we begin with U being equal to 10 meters per second. So now I can already see that to find V, I can actually use the first equation of motion. So to find that maximum velocity in third stage of motion V, I use first equation of motion, which is V is equal to U plus 80. So I have V being equal to 10 plus, into bracket 0 0.75 times 20, of which the answer shall be 25 meters per second. So now I know the value of U, the value of A, and the value of V. So now the next part is to sketch the velocity time graph for the motion of the car between A and B. So now we have it so these are the axes so we have v on the y axis and then t on the x axis so now we're being told that at the beginning the car passes at u so that means at the beginning the car started passing at a with u which was 15 meters per second so we're going to sketch that so at the beginning the car had 15 meters per second so that's actually what we have right there and we're being told that it maintains the speed for 60 seconds of which during which it travels for 900 meters. So it actually began with 15 meters per second and traveled at 900 meters. So this speed was maintained. So that's why we have a horizontal line. So, all right, for the next stage of motion, we're being told that approaching a junction, the car then slows down at a rate, uniform rate of a meters per second. So this is what we have. So we found that acceleration as negative 0 0.5 meters per second over the next 125 meters to reach a speed of 10 meters per second. So now that means that the speed dropped from 15 to 10 and there was a form of deceleration. So that's why we have it in this shape. So now we can actually have it this way. So for the next 125 meters. So now I found this value here, the time taken from here to here as 10. And how did I do that? So from V is equal to U plus 80 because I know that from here to here, the initial speed is 15, and then the final velocity is 10. And then I know the distance is 125. And then the acceleration, which was a deceleration, is negative 0 0.5. So just basically using this first equation of motion, you can find the t, and it will be 10. As it will actually be 10 seconds, as you can see right there. So that's how I found this 10. All right, so next, we're being told that for the next journey, we're being told at which instant with the road clear, the car accelerates uniformly at 0 0.75 meters per second. We're being told this acceleration is maintained for 20 seconds. So this takes a period of 20 seconds, by which time the car has reached a speed of V meters per second. Now we found that V as 25 meters per second. And that's why we label it that way. And then we're told that this is then maintained. So now we draw a horizontal line because that is actually maintained. So lastly, we'll be told that the car passes B 45 seconds after it reach its speed reaches V meters, which is 25 meters per second. So that means that from here to here, it's a period and it takes 20, 45 seconds. So that's why we have it that way. And then we don't know that distance, so we're going to just have it as S4, and that is point B. All right, so that is the graph that we actually have. All right, so lastly, we're being told to find the distance between points A and B and the time taken by the car to travel this distance. So basically, that means we are looking at the sums of the distances. So now we already know what this distance is. This is 900 plus 125. And then we now need to find this distance right here and then this distance right here. So now these are going to be easier because this is actually already a rectangle. So this will be 45 times 25. This will give me the area of this rectangle, which will actually be equal to S4. And then this one here is a trapezium. So we're going to use the formula of the trapezium for this part S3. So basically, 
S sharp should be equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. So S1 is already 900, S2 is 125, and then we know that S3 is a trapezium shape. So we're going to have a half times 20 into bracket 10 plus 25. So the 20 here actually represents the height of it. So in its case, with the way it's shaped, so as you can see, because of the way it's shaped, the height of this trapezium shall actually be this right here, which shall be 20. Then plus, then to be this distance of the base and then this side right here. So it's 10 plus 25. So it's basically a half times 20 into bracket 10 plus 25. So that's how we find S3. And then S4, which is basically a rectangle, is just basically 25 times 25 times 45, which is length times width, because that is a rectangle shape. So S sharp should be equal to 900 plus 125 plus 350 plus 1125. So S sharp should be equal to 2500 meters. So therefore, the distance between point A and point B is 2500 meters. All right, so next question, question number seven. We're being told that three points A, B, and C lie on a straight line. Then we'll be told that a particle P starts from rest at A and accelerates uniformly at three meters per second squared until it reaches point B. It then decelerates uniformly at one meters per second squared to rest at C. If SC is 75 meters, note that, sketch a velocity time graph and then find the maximum velocity of the particle and the distance A, B. So now we just have to first sketch that. So let's first sketch this. So now we have V and T, and then we're being told that the particle starts from point A. So it starts from rest, and it accelerates uniformly for 3 meters per second. So this is how we represent uniform acceleration, said until it reaches a point B for 3 meters per second squared. So that is point B, and that is what we have. Now we don't know how much time it takes, so we're just going to label that as T1, and then the velocity attained, the maximum velocity, we're just going to label that as v and then the distance a b we're going to represent as s1 so next we're being told that it then decelerates uniformly so now we're representing the deceleration at one meters per second squared to rest at point c so that's what we have right there then we're going to represent the time from b to c as t2 and then we're going to represent that distance as s2 all right, so now that we've found and drawn the velocity time graph, so we're being asked next to find the maximum velocity of the particle and the distance A, B. But before we do that, we've been given a condition here that if SC is 75 meters, so that is actually a condition that we're going to look at. So let's look at, some means we're looking at the distance SC. So for total distance SC, which is going to be S, we've been told that the total distance is 75 meters. So what that means is that this S1 plus this S2 shall actually be equal to 75 meters as given right there. So if total distance ABC is represented by capital S, we'll have capital S being equal to S1 plus S2. And then next we can see that we've been given that S is 75. So 75 is equal to S1 plus S2. So now we can actually uniquely arrange this. And then we can actually see that S1 shall actually be equal to 75 minus S2. And why is that? It's because we're being asked to find that distance A, B. So a distance A, B is S1. So if we make S1 the subject, S1 shall actually be equal to 75 minus S2. So now the next important thing is we need to find the values of S1 and S2 to actually solve everything else. And then we've been told to find the maximum velocity v. So this is this v value right here. So that means we need to use uh, an equation of motion that relates velocity to distance. So because if we are to look at the distance a b, for example, we know what a is, we know what acceleration is, and then we, we are being told to find v. So v is what we're looking for, and then we're dealing with distance. So which equation of motion has acceleration v and then uh, s it's basically the third equation of motion so now for first stage of motion a b from third equation of motion we can say that v squared is equal to u squared plus 2 a s and we already know the value of a that at the very beginning if we look at the distance uh, or the motion from a to b you can see at the very beginning acceleration was zero because the particle began from rest and then 
the v squared is the v that we're looking for right here so v squared is equal to 0 squared plus 2 times this 3 times s1 which is the distance from a to b so we'll have v squared being equal to 6s1 and then we'll have v being equal to root of 6s1 and that shall be our equation 2 and now looking at the second equation of motion bc we now want to relate that to velocity so what happens here is for the distance a b its final velocity is v and then if we look at the distance bc the initial velocity shall also this be this v right here so a b and bc have a common relationship and we can use that relationship to find the value of v and then after that we'll know the distances that are remaining so i'm going to make use of that relationship because a b the final velocity is this v and then to move from bc the initial velocity actually actually b v so let's look at the movement from b to c so now there we have that initial velocity shall actually be represented by that v and then the final velocity sh shall actually be uh, zero as you can see then we know the acceleration is a and then the distance is s2 so we need to use one that actually utilizes this relationship right here so for the second stage of motion bc we're also going to use the third equation of motion v squared is equal to u squared plus 2a s so as you can already see that the final velocity there shall actually be zero squared when it actually reaches point c and then we can see that uh, the initial velocity at that point for the motion bc is the same as the final velocity of the motion ab of which now we know the final velocity of the motion ab was root 6s one so we're going to have that as our initial velocity for the motion b c plus 2 a s which the acceleration is negative one because uh we have a deceleration that's why we have it as a negative one because we're decelerating times s2 which is the distance b c so we shall have it this way now i can take this to the other side and i have 2 s2 being called 6 s1 then divide both sides by 2 and i can actually see that s2 is equal to 3 s1 so now we know that so this is now what we have so now the next step is i can actually see that we know that s1 is equal to 75 minus s2 from equation one so we actually have a way of representing that so where there is s1 i'm going to replace that with 75 minus s2 so i have s2 being equal to 3 into 75 minus s2 of which if i open brackets 75 times 3 is 225 and then s2 times 3 as you can see right there so now i can ac actually bring this to this side collect terms that are in common s2 this will become s2 plus 3s2 which is 4s2 being equal to 225 divide both sides by 4 and s2 shall actually be equal to 56.25 meters all right so now that we know the value of s2 we can substitute for s2 into equation 1 where s1 was actually equal to 75 minus s2 so we can use that to get s1 s1 shall be equal to 75 minus 56.25 or which s1 shall be 18.75 meters so now we know the distance of a b so therefore that distance is 18.75 meters so next we need to find that maximum velocity v and we're going to make use of this equation two right there because now we know the value of s1 so we'll have that so substituting for s1 into equation two we shall actually be equal to root of six times 18.75 of which if we find the answer it will be 10.61 meters per second so therefore the distance a b is 18.75 meters and the maximum velocity is v being equal to 10.61 meters per second all right so moving on to the next question so this is a question from in 2007 and this is question number 10. so being told that a car started from rest and accelerated uniformly for two minutes and then maintained a speed of 50 kilometers per hour and be told that another car started two minutes later from the same spot and this car too accelerated uniformly for two minutes and it then maintained a speed of 75 kilometers per hour then we're being asked to draw a velocity time graph and find when and where the second car overtook the first and then part two are being told that the first car maintained a speed of 50 kilometers per hour for 10 minutes it then decelerated uniformly for two and a half minutes before coming to rest how far has the car traveled from the start all right so first thing i see is i need to convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second then i also need to convert these minutes to seconds so now how are we going to do that so to convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second 50 kilometers per hour it's going to be 50 times a thousand over 3600 which shall be equal to 125 over 9 meters per 
seconds. So I've now converted that. Then the 75 kilometers per hour shall be 75 times 1000 over 3600, which shall be equal to 125 over 6 meters per second. So now we've successfully converted those two. So now let's look at the next part. So I've been told to draw a velocity time graph. So I believe in this question, it's better to just follow the order so that you actually don't get confused along the way. So drawing a velocity time graph comes first and then secondly, we shall deal with this next second part where we find when and where the second car overtook the first. All right, so let's sketch a velocity time graph. So here's the velocity time graph with the axes with V and time. So I've been told that so we're going to assume that we're going to start from a point A. So we're going to make the, so what I'm going to do in this question is I'm going to represent the journey of the first car as A, B, C and the journey of the second car as X, Y, Z so that we can differentiate them on the velocity time graph because we're going to have a graph representing two different cars. So now being told that the first car starts from rest, so that means that we're going to begin from point zero right here so a is going to be at the point zero and well it's unif accelerated uniformly for two minutes so this is actually the uniform acceleration right there so it's accelerated for two minutes which is actually 120 seconds and then we'll be told that it maintained that speed so actually uniform acceleration is represented this way so it accelerated until it reached a speed of 50 kilometers per hour which is represented as 125 over 9 meters per second so all right, so next we've been told that it then maintained this speed of 50 kilometers per hour or 125 over 9 meters per second. So this is what we actually have right here. So this is the journey of the first car from A to B, then B to C. So we don't know the time it took uh, as it maintained that speed, but we're just going to leave it that way. So I've been told that another car started two minutes later from the same spot, and this car too accelerated uniformly for two minutes so we're going to have this other second car so its journey is going to be xyz so we're going to begin from point x then it's going to accelerate for two minutes so it accelerated uniformly for two minutes before it maintained the speed of 75 kilometers per hour so it accelerated until it attained a speed of 75 kilometers per hour which is 125 over 6 meters per second now 125 over 6 is actually greater than this value right here so that's why we have it going a little bit higher in velocity and we're saying that that happens for two minutes also so that's why we have it this way and then we're being told that it then maintained a speed of 75 kilometers per hour so that's why we have it now as a flat line because that speed is now maintained and we don't know for how long the speed is maintained so that's what we have so that's the journey x y z and then for the time between here and here the, since this that time is unknown we're just going to label it as t and then that is the journey of the second car all right so since we are talking about the second car overtaking the first car at some point that's why we actually have to have a meeting point right here where we're going to have them meeting because the second car can only overtake the first car after they first meet and then another important concept in this question is that they both start from the same spot so what that means that at the point of meeting both cars would have covered the same distance so now let's deal with the first car so for the first car's distance covered we're going to label that as s a b c so let's look at the first car's distance so as you can see to measure this first distance so look at the distance ABC. We have a right angle triangle here. So we need to find the area of this right angle triangle to find the distance from here to here, which it covers. So it's going to be a half times 120, which is its base, times its height, which is going to be 125 over 9. Plus, now the next part of the first car's journey is actually a rectangle. So we have 120 as the base here, and then we have 125 over 9 representing its side right here. Remember, the area of a rectangle is length times width, so we have 120 times 125 over 9 plus. So we look at its next part of motion, so which is now this rectangle right here. So we don't know that time taken, so we're going to have one of the sides as t, and then the height is going to be 125 over 9. So we have t times 125 over 9 for this rectangle. So now, the distance SABC for the first car should actually be equal to this. Now we can actually extract out 125 over 9 because it's there in common in every side. A half times 120 is 60 plus this 120 plus this T. So now when I add this, I'll have 180. So now I'll have SABC being equal to 125 over 9 into bracket 180 plus T and that should be my equation 
1. So now let's look at the distance for the second car. So S, X, Y, Z. So if you look at the second car, we actually have a right angle triangle right here. Then we have a rectangle right here. So let's look at this right angle triangle for first part of its journey. So we'll have the base as 120 and we'll have the height as 125 over 6. So to calculate the area of this right angle triangle is a half times base, which is 120 times the height, which is 125 over 6 plus. If we look at this next part of its motion, we have a rectangle. The base down here is t and then the height is 125 over 6 so, so you have t times 125 over 6 so multiply those i can actually set i can extract out 125 over 6 and i'll be left with a half times 120 which is 60 plus this t and then therefore the distance covered by the second car s x y z should actually be equal to 125 over 6 into 60 plus t now the most important concept is that at the point of meeting both cars would have covered the same distance so that means we're going to have a C B C being equal to S X Y Z. So we're going to equate equation one and equation two. So equating equation one and equation two, we'll have one twenty five over nine times one eighty plus t being equal to one twenty five over six times sixty plus t. So the next thing I can see is that one twenty five and one twenty five will cancel. Then nine divided by three is three, and then six divided by three is two. So I have now a third into one eighty plus t being equal to half into sixty plus t. So multiply the third inside, and we'll have 60 plus t over 3 multiply the half inside and we'll have 30 plus t over 2 so now collect like terms take the 30 to the other side and bring t over 3 to this side so we'll have 60 minus 30 being equal to t over 2 minus t over 3 of which we'll have 30 being equal to t over 6 cross multiply and we'll have t being equal to 180 seconds all right so since we're looking for where the second car overtook the first we're going to substitute 14 to equation 2 where we have the distance of the second car so we have s x y z being equal to 125 over 6 then in two brackets 60 plus 180 now 60 plus 180 is going to be equal to 240 240 times 125 over 6 shall actually give me 5000 meters as you can see right there all right so now that we know the value of t we can now look for how long it took for the second car to overtake the first car. As you can see, let's look at the journey of the second car. You can actually see that we have 120 plus the other time it took was 180 seconds, which is this T. So we look at that movement up to the point that A met because it overtook that first car at the point of meeting, which is right here. So we have 120 plus 180. So therefore, the second car overtook the first at a spot 5,000 meters from the starting point and it took the car 300 seconds. Of course, 120 plus 180 is 300 seconds. All right, so in part two, we're being told that the first car maintained the speed of 50 kilometers per hour for 10 minutes. It then decelerated uniformly for two and a half minutes before coming to rest. How far has the car traveled from the start? So now we're looking at the first car's remaining journey. All right, so looking at the journey of the first car, and it's to the remaining journey. Let's sketch actually something small that will actually enable us to understand it fully. So as you can remember from the very beginning, we're being told that that first car started from rest. So actually have something like this, and that happened for 120 seconds. So that actually happened. Then we've been told that it maintained a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. So now part two gives us the full knowledge. So we've been told that it maintained the speed of 50 kilometers per hour for 10 minutes so let's actually look at that so we have 50 kilometers per hour or 125 over 9 meters per second being maintained for 10 minutes what is 10 minutes 10 times 60 which is 600 seconds so we have it as 600 seconds then we're being told it then decelerated now it's but we then decelerated uniformly for two another two and a half minutes so it is two and a half minutes two and a half minutes is uh 120 plus 30, which is 150 seconds. So we've been told it deserted uniformly for two and a half minutes before coming to rest. So this is actually now what we're looking at as the remaining journey or the total distance for the first car. So we've been told how far did that car travel. So we have this as our S1, this as our S2, and this as our S3. So for total distance from the start by first car, this is what we'll have. So for this rectangle right here, Remember the height here is 125, the mean the velocity here is 125 over 9. So now if we look at this first right angle triangle, we have the height as 125 over 9. So we have a half times base, which is 120 times 125 over 9, which is the height of this rectangle. So that's the first part. 
So S2 is 600. So basically the height is 125 over 9 and then 600 is the best because it's a right, it's a rectangle. So you have 600 times 125 over 9. Then lastly we have this as a right angle triangle, a half times base which is 150 times its height which is 125 over 9. So as you can see, we have 125 over 9 in common everywhere, so you can extract that out. And then here, a half times 120 is 60, plus this 600, plus 125 times, I mean 1 over 2 times 150 is 75. So now, if we total everything and multiply everything together, we'll have 10,208.33 meters. So therefore, the first car has traveled 10,208.33 meters from the start, and that is the answer. So lastly, I have an exercise for you. These are numbers I encourage you to try out and then compare with what I actually give here as the answers for you to actually prove that you're on the right track. So first, a part one is a proof question. So you just prove that it's actually that t is going to be equal to that. Then part two, you also have to prove that this should actually be equal to that. And then in part three, the answers are actually given in brown right here, as you can see, right? there and then if i move on to the next ones so part four i'll have it this way and then there are the answers in brown color and then part five these are also the answers so you can actually pause and actually make a copy of the questions so the questions continue this is question number six and lastly this is question number seven and there are the answers thank you so much for watching Thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope the video really, really helped you. If you can, if you did, feel free to tell me below in the comments. I'll make sure to get time to read through your comments and to reply to you. And also, if you're new to this channel, I encourage you to join the community by subscribing. And then make sure to hit the notification bell so that you get updated every single time I upload a new video. Again, my name is Emmanuel Olega. See you in my next video.